Welcome to Next Law Ignite. I'm Joanne Wakeford. The rise of legal technology has been a tremendous catalyst for change in the profession. Artificial intelligence in particular already has fundamentally changed the way that law firms and in-house teams are delivering legal services to their clients. Definitely faster, possibly better, and certainly cheaper. But while many of us have a general understanding of AI, there's so much confusion around what's real, what's not, and honestly, where does one even begin? So to kickstart us on this topic, we're joined today by Stephen Klein, Chief Marketing and Strategy Officer for NextLaw. Prior to joining NextLaw, Stephen spent many years working with Silicon Valley tech startups and has fully immersed himself in the topic of artificial intelligence. Stephen, thank you very much for joining me today. All right, let's just start at the very beginning. What do we need to know about artificial intelligence today? Well, first of all, thank you, Joanne. This is, as I think you know, my favorite topic uh, on earth. And uh, in fact, was fortunate enough to, to moderate a wonderful panel at ACC, I guess it was two weeks ago. I think what we need to do is break the discussion down into three distinct components. They're related, but they're quasi separate. The first is, I guess I wanna talk about artificial intelligence in terms of introducing the overall topic and how to think about it so that we've got a framework for thinking things through. Then I'd like to talk specifically about the impact it's having and will have on the legal profession, on our profession. And then the third component of the discussion, which is extremely important, is the uh, ethics side <clears throat> of AI. And there are some very profound issues around ethics that really need to be addressed primarily by lawyers who need to take the lead. So let's start with the fact that there are two broad categories of AI in the world today. There is an AI that would be referred to as AGI, artificial general intelligence, uh, or it's also known as super intelligence. Uh, some people will refer to it as the singularity. This is that form of sci-fi artificial intelligence like HAL from 2001, in which the AI becomes human-like, evolves and grows, and some people believe actually becomes an existential threat to humankind because of the power that it would have. Now, AGI doesn't exist today, at least that I'm aware of. It is the stuff still of conjecture, projection. There are a lot of super, super smart people who are concerned. Elon Musk, Bill Gates, uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, Wozniak from Apple. There are some very bright people who are extremely concerned. And there is an estimate coming out of MIT that this singularity has a 50% probability of occurring in 45 years, but it doesn't exist today. The kind of AI that exists today is narrow AI. It's task oriented, it's a tool. And that is 99.999% of all the AI out there in the world today living and, 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 and breathing in businesses, uh, including the legal profession. Uh, and so narrow AI is really what we're going to focus uh, our talk and podcast on today. Um, I think it's really interesting, though, to pull the camera back and take perspective on where we are in terms of evolution, acceleration of technology, and the advancement of our thinking. And one of the ways that I like to do that is to basically compress the four and a half billion years that Earth has been in existence and take that four and a half billion years and compress it onto one single calendar year. And that really is a, a way to kind of see how breathtakingly fast things are moving. But because we're on the train, I don't think we notice so, for example, if you look at that calendar, life appears late February. That's when life first appears on planet Earth. But the rest of the action is all in the last month. So, for example, dinosaurs went extinct on Christmas. Uh, Homo sapien, people similar to us, uh, became, um, exist became, came into existence at about 24 minutes to midnight. The agricultural revolution was one second before midnight. And everything else post-agriculture is intense 
hundreds and thousands of that last second. And AI is on the cutting edge of that. So things are moving along very, very quickly. Another way to look at that is that 90% of all the data in the world was created in the last two years. That according to IBM, which I find to be a stunning data point, no pun intended. One wonderful example of narrow AI is IBM Watson. And in 2011, IBM Watson made a huge splash by beating the two world champions at Jeopardy. And this was pretty stunning. And one of the ways Watson did that was Watson was capable of, in a sense, reading, but more, more accurately scanning 200 million pages of both structured and unstructured data, 200 million pages. So to put that into perspective, and, and Watson could scan that in seconds, but to put that into perspective, Joanne, like you or I, if that... 200 million pages is roughly, let's, uh, let's just say it, it, it's roughly a million books. Uh, I mean, if we read a book every hour, every year, it would still take us hundreds of years. So that was an example of the power AI had back in 2011. Now, Watson is narrow AI. Even though Watson appears to be thinking, Watson can only do what it does on this very specific narrow task. So for example, Watson will not beat your son at tic-tac-toe or checkers. Watson just plays Jeopardy. But it gets even more interesting. Google bought a company called DeepMind uh, in uh, 2014 for $525 million. And it's a London-based company. It's called DeepMind. And they created a narrow AI algorithm called AlphaGo. And AlphaGo beat the world champion, Go player. And Go is just dramatically more complex than chess, dramatically more complex than the game Jeopardy. And nobody thought this was possible because there are as many optional moves in Go as there are atoms in the universe, not stars or galaxies, actual atoms in the universe, 10 to the 80th. In fact, the number, I just think this is, it's just hilarious. It's 10 quadrillion, ventillion, and 100,000 quadrillion, ventillion atoms. That's the number for 10 to the 80th power. Now, if that wasn't enough, in 2017, last year, DeepMind outdid itself and developed a new algorithm called Alpha Zero, which killed the first AlphaGo. So the one that built the, world, the one that beat the world champion was then beaten very badly by a new algorithm. And that algorithm taught itself how to play the game. It wasn't taught. It taught itself how to play the game in only eight hours through something called deep reinforced learning. And then that same algorithm was able to learn chess in 24 hours, and it achieved a superhuman level of chess in one day. So again, it's narrow AI, but it's getting more and more generalized. This AI was able to learn more than one specific game. I mean, that is completely overwhelming when you start to think about it like that. But how has artificial intelligence impacted the legal profession? Can you give me a few examples of where AI is real? Where is it being applied to the practice and to the business of law? Yes. Yes. So let's, great question. So, so let's get practical uh, and uh, get more down to earth here. So um, McKinsey and Company uh, did what is pretty much a landmark study where they looked at AI specifically in terms of its impact on the legal profession. And they developed the data point that 23% of the work that lawyers do and 35% of the work that paralegals do will be completely automated in the next few years. Okay, now it's important to note that that 23% isn't 23% of lawyers will be replaced. It's that 23% of the work lawyers do will be automated and replaced. AI will augment the work that lawyers do. It'll make lawyers more effective. Certain functions will lose their jobs. There's no doubt about it. 
but it's not going to replace lawyers. So a specific and extraordinary application that's currently up and running is uh, JP Morgan. JP Morgan has an application or an algorithm, if you will, of narrow AI in its loan department. And the loan department basically handles, I believe, an estimated 12,000 contracts a year. And prior to this AI app, that constituted 360,000 hours of human labor. And this AI app takes that 360,000 hours of human labor and compresses it into three seconds. So they've taken 360,000 hours, and now it's three seconds. And not only is it faster, and not only is it cheaper, but the, the quality improved. So that gives you some idea of the power of this stuff. Microsoft has an AI algorithm in its um, legal department that is now automating e-discovery, and they're saving something like 450 to $500 million a year just on that one app alone. So it is impacting our profession for sure. Now, there's a lot of data that would suggest that, um, again, that lawyers need not worry about being replaced by AI. I think that's probably the first question one would get asked, right? Will robots take my job away? Do I need to be concerned or worried? The answer is an unequivocal no. That's not going to happen. In fact, according to the data, the legal profession is one of the last, if not the last profession to be replaced by AI. One of the challenges, though, that I do think our profession faces is a very real reluctance to adapt. And there are reasons for that. And the reasons make sense. But to be a really, really good lawyer, whether you're with a law firm or you're inside a company, you've really got to be a perfectionist. So lawyers are taught to be perfectionists. You also tend to look back on precedent and templates. And the way the at least law firm profession is budgeted and structured, it's an annual budget process. It's kind of like a vacuum cleaner. It basically sucks up cash and distributes it and starts again every year. Whereas the corporate world does not do that. The corporate world looks far in the future, makes investments based on a potential multiple of equity and value. That is what represents innovation and represents progress. And that value comes back as monetization of stock, for example. Um, so there are very real challenges the profession faces, particularly on the law firm side, uh, that make it more challenging than some other professions to to, to, to adapt. So oftentimes there's a lot of data. Thompson Reuters published a study in 2017 that less than 1% of uh, in-house counsel are using AI. 4% are taking it seriously. And 50% aren't interested in it. That's going to change. There's just no doubt about it. I think it's important to note, again, whether you're on the law firm side or you're on in-house counsel, that Technology is a subset of innovation, and AI is a subset of technology. Innovation doesn't work in any business context, in any business model, in any industry or profession, unless it's looked at, analyzed, and examined from a holistic perspective. And what that really means primarily is unless the let's take in-house counsel, the in-house department culture is looked at. What is that corporate culture? How is it organized? What is the processes it's using? And then once that is really well understood and the problems are identified, opportunities to create more efficiencies and higher quality can be implemented, oftentimes through technology. But it's really important that there is a holistic approach that is taken when thinking about this stuff. So you hear a lot of, so sometimes people raise your hand and go, I need AI. Get me some AI. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. That's not the right question or request. I think a very useful framework 
for the legal profession to think about how to answer the question, what functions will get automated and which functions won't. So what work within the legal profession will be replaced by AI and what aspects of our profession will not be replaced. And I think the best way to do that is if you can visualize a two by two and along the Y axis, you've got frequency of tasks. And along the X axis, you've got repetition of tasks. And you think about a function, the higher that frequency and the higher that repetition in concert, the greater probability that task will be automated and or could be automated right now. So e-discovery, legal research, analytics and prediction, expertise, contract analysis, document review, due diligence, those sorts of things are the things that are being replaced today. High frequency, high repetition. But if you go to the lower left quadrant, where there's lower frequency and lower repetition, areas like advocacy, litigation, negotiation, complex fields, client development, client relationships, strategic planning, highly, highly unlikely those tasks are going to be replaced anytime soon. So that's a framework to kind of think things through um, that, I, that I find helpful. You mentioned, Stephen, that you recently chaired a, a panel on ethical and legal implications of artificial intelligence at the Association of Corporate Counsel annual meeting, along with a few other pretty impressive industry thought leaders. What are some of the primary ethical issues that were discussed at that panel and, and being discussed today as it relates to artificial intelligence? This, for me, this is the compelling issue of our time because it's sneaking up on us and it's happening really quickly. And most people think about ethics in terms of AGI, which we discussed a little bit earlier. They think about what are the ethics of developing artificial intelligence that replaces humanity, that threatens humanity, and all those sorts of concepts, if you will. But this is ethics very specifically within the current business environment and narrow AI. And the overall rubric for thinking that through is something that I would refer to as value alignment related to the law of unintended consequences. Because these narrow AI applications are being built by people, and often not a diverse group of people, but being built by engineers, and then being fed data, because that's what makes this machine learning and narrow AI powerful, is the data. What happens is you get these unintended consequences. So, so the, the algorithm is designed to do something, but unfortunately, you find out later it's doing something else. It evolved. It kind of thought for itself and it learned and it adapted based on the data it's being fed. And what happens is the AI gets biased. You get, lab, you get, you, you get data bias. And I can give you some examples of that. So, for example, in 13 states right now, in the United States of America, there is an AI app produced. It's called Compass that's now incorporated into the judicial system in 13 states across the United States that judges are using as a primary tool to sentence convicts. And this algorithm estimates recidivism rates and gives them predictors of how long these sentences ought to be. Now, this has been going on for a few years, and no one knew there was a problem until somebody looked at the data and started analyzing and realized this algorithm is very biased. It's not a fair algorithm. It's a biased algorithm. And this has actually gone to court, Supreme Court in Wisconsin. And the judges voted against the person challenging the sentence because of the algorithm, because they couldn't quite make the case or understand it. But they felt very, very uncomfortable with it. The manufacturer of the AI doesn't want to disclose what's going on because they're claiming it's a trade secret. So here you see this tension between the industry and the judicial system and fairness and unfairness. And the simple solution, other than enforcing ethical guidelines on the industry, which I do think the legal profession should take the lead in doing, the solution is really 
some fundamental common sense sorts of attributes. So rather than letting AI be this black box, which it often is, it's honestly a black box, unlike conventional computing, where you can open the thing up, you can look at your software, you can go through the code, you can find your bugs, you can find your mistakes, you can fix it, and you can shove the software back in the, in the computer. AI doesn't work that, that way because it, it's based oftentimes on neural nets. And so once that thing gets started, nobody knows what it's doing anymore. The people who built it don't know what it's doing. So it's this black box that evolves based on the algorithm and based on the data. And so there's no transparency. You can't look in it. There's argument over who's accountable. You know, is the implementer accountable? Is the manufacturer accountable? Is it a hardware problem? Is it a software problem? So transparency is really critical. Accountability is really critical. And then there's obvious factors, for example, security, the ability to hack it, and so forth. So these are very, very critical and important issues. What advice would you give to lawyers today on this topic? I think the first thing I would say is I wouldn't be afraid of AI. I would take this framework and learn as much about the topic as you can. And don't learn about it only because you want to see very specifically how it's going to impact your job, whether you're on the, in the law firm or whether you're on, on the um, in-house side. That's important, but I have confidence, 100% confidence, that law firms and in-house counsel are going to figure this stuff out because we're really super smart. It, it, so, so I'm not worried about AI being implemented properly. It may be later than it should be, but it's going to happen. My advice would be learn as much about it as you can. Take a holistic approach, culture, organization, process, and technology. But also really think about taking responsibility for the ethics side of it, because I think that the legal profession can and should lead that discussion and help business understand and deal with these challenges because someone's going to have to, and there's no one better positioned than lawyers to do that. So that would be the advice I give uh, a lawyer today. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. This has been a really exciting conversation. I can tell that you're very passionate about the subject, and I feel that it's such a, an immense uh, and enormous scope that we definitely need to revisit this. And so I look forward to having uh, future conversations with you on this topic. Thank you, Joanne. I enjoyed it enormously. Appreciate the opportunity.